Well, I am both honored and a little overwhelmed uh, to be up here speaking to all of you. Um, I, grew up, I grew up playing baseball and had the good fortune of uh, playing baseball in college. I was a left-handed pitcher and was used uh, primarily as a closer. And I am in the position up here of being the closer of a game that's a no-hitter right now. This has been an absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, and I, you know, I'll self-admit, I'm a planning geek. Um, a lot of my spare time is spent dealing with stuff like this just because I like it. That makes me a little, maybe that's part of being left-handed too. But um, what you have received today from, from all of the previous speakers is invaluable. And, and really, credit goes to staff, as far as I, I'm aware, I, I'm not sure. I'm aware of, I guess, a little bit of, in terms of how this was formulated and put together. But this is an incredible forum to be talking about, about zoning and how to look at things. And you've had speakers that I, I have a high respect for. I know, I know most of the people personally that have been up here speaking to you, and they are experts in their field. So I'm hoping that what has been provided to all of you will be taken advantage of. I am also a local product. 28 of my, of my first 30 years in life were spent as a resident of Orem and Provo. Two-year exception was an LDS mission in Oakland, California. Um, and like I mentioned, I am just... This has been my life for as far as I can remember, going back as far as I can remember, because I have been trying to figure out how to do things differently. That has been my drive in terms of my profession, my schooling, so on and so forth. I do not claim to know all the answers, but I do claim to have some. I will, I will present you with uh, what I believe are some of the potential answers to, to questions that you might be seeking today, but by no means are my answers comprehensive. I will also disclaimer, I am speaking for myself alone. I am not speaking, I don't want any misrepresentation that I'm up here speaking for my employer, for the nonprofits I work for, although all of that is a reflection of, I guess you could say, the filter through which I see the world. So I'm going to start by telling you a little story really quickly. Um, I got dragged into the real estate and development business by my father kicking and screaming. I did not want to be a part of it. Uh, fortunately, because I, it, it led me to finding my passion in this, in this world, um, I, I took him up on, on the the challenge to, to, to uh, be part of it with him. Um, I spent about two years, 93 to 95, selling new construction real estate in Utah County. But I will, I will tell you, I, was, I, I felt I was dealing with a moral dilemma because I didn't like what I was selling. And it wasn't until 19, summer of 1995 changed my world. By happenstance, I visited Cantlands in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Have any of you been there? Few of you have been there. My world got turned upside down because for the first time in my life, I saw something that was different than everything else I had seen, but it was, it was present. It wasn't, it wasn't something from the past. And I realized, I, it just, I didn't know how they did this, but I knew it was a, a different product, a different deliverable in terms of development than what I was selling. So as, you know, a, a, a young guy, I come back from, I come back from making this visit, and I go in and start telling the developer that I was representing in terms of selling his homes, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. We need, to, we need to do it like this. I didn't know how they did this, like I said, but I was in his ear constantly telling him things that I, didn't, I knew nothing of 
other than the, the product that was being delivered was different than what it was he was doing. So what I have learned since that time, and it has been said, maybe not this directly, but it has been said by every person that has stood at this podium, the current system for delivering development is broken. I don't think there's anybody here that would argue that. We had, we had Dave Gardner up here giving us living examples of his experiences in trying to do development and the challenges he faced based on the system that was in place. All of these books, in my opinion, I mean, and this is, this is only a fraction. Again, being the self-professed planning geek that I am, this is the kind of stuff that I read in my spare time because I, I enjoy it. All of these are a commentary on how the system is broken. The thing that I want you to remember, if you, if you remember nothing else of what I say today and you only remember one thing, I want you to understand that zoning is the DNA of your community. If you don't like what's being produced, don't blame the developer. It is your zoning that, whether you call it DNA or operating system, they are producing what is allowed. And what, what city government then has to react to is the underwhelming delivery of the application that's been submitted to them. And they have to fight tooth and nail to try and improve it, not necessarily realizing that the very code that the developer was following is the problem. So please, please remember that because you stand at a point in time right here where you're asking the question, what is wrong and how do we fix it? And if you do nothing, nothing's gonna change. You're gonna get the same old stuff and, and be completely disappointed with it from here on out. Okay, so I wanna share an, what I call, this is my own theoretical mind going, what I call the golden triangle theory. And this is very important to understand because this is a precursor to what, in terms of realization as to what at, actually is going on, granted I'm simplifying a little bit, but it's understanding the principle of the relationships that exist in order to pull off a development project. You need, you need an alignment of policy, development, and economics. And if those three things do not come into alignment, nothing happens. And you have, you have, I'm sure as you think about it, you can, you can actually register examples in your mind of how this is true. Take for, take for example, um, a willing developer who has financing that wants to do a project, but the project, and the project is stellar. Nobody would argue with the project, but the policy won't allow it. Example, what Ross talked about in terms of his projects, he could not walk into Provo today and do what he does so well because it's illegal. It's not, it's not, and these are, I, again, self-professed planning geek. I've, I have visited most of his pro projects because that's what I do when I go on trips. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sick in my mind. <laughs> the photos that he showed of, of his communities don't even compare to walking them. They are amazing. He's doing the right thing, but if he walked in the door today to do what he has been doing for years, he would be denied at the desk because it's illegal. He could go through the process and, and change, like, like Dave talked about, try and make all the changes to make it legal, but chances are the, the process that it would take to do that would, would scare him off and he'd go, he'd go back to Washington. I'll take questions when I, when I, when I get there, if you'll, just let, if you'll 
just amuse me. So these, these are basically linking, or these are core elements in the golden triangle. Now the, they're linked together by an understanding of the relationships that exist. What ties those things together? So from the standpoint where, where we're concentrating on in this discussion is between policy and development. Um, the thing that you have to understand is that, that policy and development is tied together by planning and design. And we, we've heard that, and that's, that's been borne out. So I don't want to belabor that point. But that's where the connection exists. What cities typically don't understand is that there is another form of governance that's going on that the developer is subject to, and the cities don't take advantage of it. It's already there. And, this, and the developer is subject to it. It is the market. It's the economics. The developer, as much as you may or may not want to hear it, if their product or if their project can't pencil, they're not, they're not doing anything. So, so that's another level of governance that, that frankly isn't contemplated in, in terms of this process but ought, ought to be thought about because it, it's there and it's, it's doing a job of, of regulating the developer that if paired with the, the code of the city, the zoning code, is going to deliver results that you're not, you're not currently seeing. So here's, here's another demonstration of the self-professed planning geek. Um, it is my opinion that development, in terms of the rules that govern development, should be more in line with the rules of nature. I heard Ross say the same thing, he just didn't say it that directly, as he was talking about carrying capacity. So I've, I've, whoops, I've pulled a quote here from a book called Life's Operating Manual, which I thought was a phenomenal book. Oh man, and I've got a, a, a weird thing going there with my text. Okay. While, while that's getting fixed, I'll, I'll, paraf I'll paraphrase here. Basically what, what the quote is, is, is stating is that nature operates by laws, and those laws are irrefutable. And in those laws is, is one called the law of balance. You know, um, the, the, the trendy term for that would be sustainability. In that is the understanding, and this is, you know, it, I, I, have, I have young kids. I had to, you know, you, when you have kids, you go through all the Disney movies. This is, this is basically Lion King, okay? This is the circle of life. Nature does not take more than it needs. That is an irrefutable law of nature. But that's, that's not how we operate as human beings, unfortunately. We have, we have the power of free will, and we can choose to act outside of those laws. My niece, I, I spent last week in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and one of my nieces encouraged me to read the zombie survival guide. And as I was reading, I came across this quote, uh, and the, it's covered. My, the problem with PowerPoint is it doesn't, I should have made a, there we go. Americans have always been obsessed with the idea of labor-saving machinery. In all walks of life, industry struggles in an endless race to invent and perfect machines that make the chores of everyday life faster, easier, and more efficient. And what could be a greater deity of American techno-religion than the automobile? If you understand the, the, the history of planning, so many things changed with the industrial age and the introduction of the automobile. When we design our neighborhoods and our communities, they're not done at a human scale. They're done at the scale of an automobile. That is a problem. Okay, go ahead. I would disagree. I would say that that's the scale of fire, cuts, and bugs. <laughs> yeah. 
I believe both of those are vehicles. But no, you're 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 right. You're right. And I'll 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 hit on that. But the the point is in terms of human history up until the industrial age uh, human beings had to build their communities in conjunction with natural laws because that's what you had to do to survive. They were also built at the scale of the human being. All of that has been thrown out the window and we have been living a physical and social experiment for about 80 years. And if you measure the results of that experiment, the experiment was an utter failure. In my opinion, as a self-professed planning geek. I, because we're, we're robbing ourselves of what neighborhood and community is supposed to be. We're only, th we, we have turned community into a commodity that is not designed at the scale of a human being. That's my opinion. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's the fact, but that's, that's my opinion. And you can argue with it, but it's my opinion. As a self-professed planning geek. Yes. and a less prosperous life based on the pattern that, that, that we're going through. So here's, here's the counter to the, the, the law of balance in terms of when the law is violated in nature. In nature, when it's violated in, in language that we're familiar with, when nature takes more than than it needs, at the, at the, in terms of a human being, we call that cancer. Our cancer in terms of development is urban sprawl. It is not sustainable. I think, I think uh, and that's more than just my opinion. That, when you, when you dig into the the economics of how cities work, it is irrefutable that sprawl does not pay for itself. You have to borrow against your future and pay for your past when you emit a sprawl pattern. So we have to identify the problem. A big part of the problem and, and the, this quote identifies it in terms of walkability, but walkability translates to human scale. If we do things outside of human scale, then um, we're going to run into problems. So I mentioned earlier that I was in Savannah last week. Savannah is old. So the idea of calling it new is, do, doesn't really work. But the principles by, under which Savannah still exists and, and based in, terms of, in terms of it being started, you know, it, was, it, was, it was founded in 1733 by General James Oglethorpe. That was in a time period in which they had to follow natural law. And what's interesting, I, I, I walked around Savannah with my sister and my brother-in-law two days. Not two days straight, but on two separate days. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't shut up about it. I just kept going on and on about what I was seeing and, and interpreting to them you know, you know, what I know about what, why Savannah is the way that it is, because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, the thing that you need to remember is Savannah was, Savannah was quote unquote developed with no zoning. This was, this was what you did. If you don't develop this way in terms of creating community, you die. 
They did it this way because it was part of survival and part of what made things work. So there's a lot that can be learned as to some of these old places, Savannah, Charleston, Boston, older cities that started with no zoning. They just did what they did because that's, that's, how, you, that's how you lived and, and how you made things work. And you look, you look at this. I, I was going to put more pictures in, but I, I probably would have just completely blown over the slideshow with, with, with photos because it's just it's an absolutely amazing place. And some of you have probably been there, and you, you, you know good places when you visit them. I mean, it, it resonates in your, in your heart. That was the experience that I had at Kentlands. My heart and my head were telling me, this is different. This is, this is, this is something that, uh, this is how things should be done. This could be anywhere. In fact, I, I know what my source is on this, but I couldn't tell you where this is. I mean, this could be, I don't know, anywhere in, in Utah. It could be California. It could be Indiana, Florida. Now, what I want you to what I want you to look at there, there there are there is a pattern of development there that is very reflective of just about every zoning code in this country. And what's interesting is you can identify it by its product. Because most zoning codes in this country regulate use and density. That's it. And you heard, you heard Dave talk about that, that the fight in his neighborhood was over density. Because that's what your zoning regulates. Density is not the problem. It's, it's how it's emitted. That's the problem. But what you have to understand is that the DNA is what allows it to occur to begin with. You want different results, you have to change the operating system. So what are the obstructions? The, the zoning code itself, we, you know, I've, I've, I've pretty well varied that. I, I think you're, you're very clear in terms of where I stand on that. Um, the commitment to the automobile, that is a problem. Now, the, I'm not saying that we go back to carriages and horses. The automobile is part of our life and is, has created a convenience if it's put in its proper place. But I will, I will venture to say, if you all think about it, the way that our communities are put together, the automobile isn't a choice, it's a prosthetic. It's something that we have to have. That is a problem. We need to, we need to balance the needs of the automobile and the convenience that it provides us with the scale at which we should be living, which is a human scale. The city ordinances and, and standards, and that, you know, that's you know, public works, public safety. These are things that, that become hurdles because of the system. We shouldn't be designing our roads based on the turning radius of a fire truck, but guess what? That's how it's done. So what does it do? It gives you uh, an asphalt width that, has, that, that exceeds the scale of a human being and makes it, makes it dangerous uh, for, for people to, to move around. Why do we have play dates? Instead of letting the kid go out the door, some would argue it's a safety thing in terms of you, know, you don't want you know, your child taken. But my goodness, do you want your kids walking further than they have to next to traffic that's, that's built to a design speed that, that exceeds um, its uh, relationship to the human being? That's not good. Okay. So the big question is, Mark, and is what do we do? I mean, this is, this is overwhelming. You are not the only city in this country that's asking this question. 
about how do we how do we change things but there are some unique opportunities because of who Provo is that Provo can come out of this quicker, faster, and easier than other cities in this country. And I'm gonna I'm gonna share those ideas with you based and this this is based this is based on a whole bunch of work. And what's interesting about it is a lot of it ties directly to our heritage. Okay, hopefully, hopefully that piques your interest a little bit. In a 100 year period, the LDS church settled 757 communities. The success rate of those communities was 90%. Think about that. Just in Utah, 443 communities with a success rate of 94%. How in the world did they do that? They had an operating system called the Plat of Zion. So what you're seeing on the left is the plat. Around all the edges of that plat are instructions as to how the operating system works. In those instructions, I've, I've listed basic principles that are associated with that operating system. I want you to look at that operating system and think about the city of Provo. What is the correlation? One of those 443 communities that was settled was Provo using that operating system. When you look at an aerial map, of Provo, um, the un, the, somebody that doesn't know Provo could tell you exactly where zoning started. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to understand the the history of Provo and Provo as a place. All you have to look at is the pattern. The pattern will tell you. How many of you are familiar with Andres Twani? Okay, a, a good number of you. For those of you that aren't, Andres Twani is arguably one of the brightest minds in architecture, urban design, and planning in the world. I had an opportunity to work on a project with him, a Utah project. And I, I want you to read this quote. Andres Duany became so enamored with Mormon community building that after working on the project, he was running around the world telling everyone that they needed to do things like the Mormons. I mean, just, just take a look at the quote. And the challenge that, that comes from that quote, we have been misusing the system. We took an operating system that's designed to provide sprawl and injected it into a system that is meant to produce, produce balanced communities. Shame on us. He went so far, Andres Dwani went so far as to call Brigham Young the Henry Ford of urbanism. I, I think that's pretty cool, but I'm a planning geek, so I'll have to temper that a little bit. Hopefully, hopefully that's resonating with all of you a little bit. So in the project that, 
that, uh, that I worked on with, with Andres, we set, we set a number of, of a, objectives because we wanted, we wanted to produce a product that could serve as an operating system template. So this is, this is the list of the, of the things, the, the challenges, the objectives that we gave him in terms of putting things together. Formalize the management of future growth. Is that something that would be a benefit to the city of Provo? I think so. Assist in managing other land-related assets. Land is not the only, the, the only thing that needs to be governed when, you think, when, you're, when you're dealing with development. On the particular project that we were working on, we had to figure out how to manage water. So water became part of, of, uh, of, the, of the system. Account for market, size, and time. Now this is, this is an interesting one because um, what were the two things that I told you that Euclidean zoning regulates? Do you remember? Density and use. Now, what, what I want you to understand as it relates to, to that issue, use is an element of the market. And part of the problem with the system as it exists today is that questions regarding market are answered before the question needs to be answered. So this, the system isn't working. Now when you're looking, and, and this was a particular issue in terms of our project because we were talking about thousands of acres. That takes a long time to absorb in terms of development. So if, if you have to start answering questions of use on thousands of acres today, how often are you going to, are you going to get those, are you going to answer those questions correctly? I would venture to say slim to none. Assist in balancing short and long-term interests. The thing that, um, that's constantly at play between developers and municipalities is trying to balance those two because you're on different timetables. Cities have a long-term view and they, they have to in terms of managing the municipality from a government standpoint. Developers don't care. They care about their time window, which is short. So they're not necessarily going to be looking out for your interests. But those two things have to be balanced. So how do you do that? Addressing the context of transitions from rural to urban. That again is making reference to the environment that, that we create our human habitat. When we, create a human, when we create communities, we are taking from nature. So that's something that has to be balanced and measured. And then you have to also take into consideration what's there first. If you're the guy with the greenfield site that's completely surrounded by existing development, everything that you saw Ross present, that's the condition that he has to work with from an infill standpoint. It's important that you respect those edges. So that's, that's part, of the, part of the process. Balancing flexibility and certainty. What do developers want? In terms of those two, do, do they want flexibility or certainty? They want certainty in process. That's what you heard Dave Gardner say. But they, they want flexibility. They want to be able to have, they want to be able to, to have some room to, um, oh, what's the word? Um, well, they just, they want, they want things to be flexible because they're having to commit to decisions, oftentimes, like I mentioned earlier, before the decision has to be made. What if they could be allowed some latitude based on a process so that they can make better decisions and the city gets better results. Cities want certainty. We want to know exactly what's going to happen when we cut that developer loose. Those two things, um, those two things need to be uh, managed, measured, and balanced. 
and then from from an, from an LDS perspective, this has been this has been alluded to in many different ways, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go straight at it. When an apartment complex comes in, why do people fight it in this community? I, whoops, all, all of you are right, but from an LDS perspective, what is the argument? You gotta talk about it and deal with it and keep from being blown up. You're gonna blow up my ward. Is the problem the apartment as a housing type? No, absolutely not. Everyone in this room, I, I saw it. When the question was asked, who has rented? Everybody raised their hand. The issue isn't the housing type, it's the concentration. But guess what zoning requires? It requires the concentration. That is a problem. And then the, the, the last one was the challenge to validate the plat of Zion. Do its principles make sense in being reapplied today? We don't, we don't at the time we didn't know. So we wanted, to, we wanted to figure that out. What, um, what, what we delivered in terms of an operating system template was a form-based code. This is where it gets challenging for me as, as the closer trying to come in and, and make sure to ensure that the no-hitter stays intact. Because you have been delivered some fabulous messages. And um, things were said for me that, um, that I don't need to, I, I, it, it took some pressure off a little bit. The question was raised of Dave Gardner. Would you like to operate under a form-based code? And what was his answer? Paraphrasing, it was, it was more than a yes. It was, yeah. Give me the system. That's, that's what I want, all day long, every day. And I'll, I'll give you some reasons as to why that occurs. Now, this, this is the best, in my opinion, the best definition that I've ever found on what a form-based code is. And the reason that I am such an advocate for it and the reason that I'm on the, the board of directors for the form-based code institute is because I believe in it. I, I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you it is the answer. But I will say with a very emphatic voice that in my opinion, it is the best solution available today. There will probably be things that will come after and later, but in terms of looking at the operating system that almost every municipality in this country has on their books right now, and in answering the question that all of you are sitting in this room today to, to try and answer as to how to fix it, in my opinion, there is no better solution than a form-based code. Whoa, man, I'm terrible with these mics. Go ahead. That is a great question. Um, I, I, the, the, very, the, the quick answer is to say, um, to, you could go to formbasedcodes.org, which is the website for the Form Based Codes Institute. They will have a number of different references. If, if, uh, if the city's interested and if, if there's a place to put it, I, I can provide things to, to, to Matt Taylor that can, that can be used. There is, this is not a new thing. I, that, that's something that I want all of you to understand. Form-based codes have been around for over 30 years. So it's not like, it's not like, uh, um, it's, it's not like it's something that hasn't been tested. It's been extremely t well tested. And, and, you know, there are good form-based codes and there are bad form-based codes. But um, it, it, is, it is, in my opinion, the right, the right step. What a form-based code does, we don't have time to get into all the minutia of how it works, and frankly, I would probably bore all of you to tears and you'd go to sleep because 
Again, I geek out on this stuff, you guys probably won't. But basically what a form-based code does is it reconstitute what is being regulated and where the, uh, where the items of importance lie. Euclidean zoning or use-based zoning does address form, but it is, it is so minor in terms of what's addressed. And what a form-based code does is it helps to reconstitute and put the primary emphasis on form. You're still dealing with use. So the, the regulation of use doesn't go away. It's just the, um, the weight that's placed on it is, is different. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you kind of a, a quick breakdown in terms of how it works. This particular map, so we're starting, we're starting at a macro level, at a community level. Um, and this comes from a form-based code that was done for the, for the downtown of, of, of Ventura, California. What you're seeing, if, now think of this in terms of a zoning map. When you see a zoning map, um, how many colors are you typically looking at? You have a whole Crayola box, right? Okay, that's, that's a good size Crayola box. Okay, what, what do you see here? It's, it's not 50. What, what basically is being dealt with at, at this level and, and the, the shades of, of purple that you're looking at, that's registering intensity. Okay? Form comes at another, at another level, but at the level of the community, what you're doing is you're recognizing where areas can be intense and, and where they need to be less intense. That's, that's one of the primary objectives here. Yeah? Now, within, within those two colors, you have to then look at what it's actually regulating at the next level. So what I'm, what I'm going to show you here is at the next level of the neighborhood, what it does is it basically unbundles the components of form that are regulated and, and based on the appropriateness that you're, you're looking at at the, at the level above in terms of intensity, sets the appropriateness for putting things back together. So using, the, using these images, you, you, and I've got, an, I've got another set of images here, you're taking the aspects of, of, of the built form and you're saying, okay, we need to regulate um, the relationship of streets to buildings, of public space to private space. Um, we, have to, we, have to, we have to look at we have to look at the aspects of the relationship of buildings to each other, which is, a, which is a, a, an aspect of scale. And as you, as, you, as you take those elements and based on the appropriateness of the intensity, start to put it together, um, the, the, for lack of a better term, the, the puzzle pieces uh, fit more soundly. And the, the arguments relative to density, proximity, scale, mass, are, they're all addressed based on what it is that you're, you're emitting from an intensity level. And then at the level of the building, there are things that you're regulating. You know, you're, you're, reg, you're regulating you know, the, the, the massing and the composition of the building. The, the openings of the building, where, where they are, what, you know, what's, a, what's appropriate. And then, you know, the, you know, the, the frontages. What are, you, what are you doing in terms of, in terms of make, allowing the building to address its environment, the, the, 
you know, uh, the face of the building and its relationship to the street. How are all of those things coming into play and in, in, in working together rather than against each other or being out of context with each other? Um, I'm a particular fan of form-based codes that integrate what's called the transect. The transect is an ecological term from science that talks about the relationship of things in nature to each other. Um, there, there are natural environments that, uh, that allow certain things to exist in harmony with everything else because, again, nature functions based on the law of balance. Human beings do things all the time to, to violate things ecologically. Invasive species. How many of you are familiar with the, the snakehead fish? Go look up on Google what a snakehead fish is. They are scary looking. They have, they have lungs that allow them to, to move from water to land to water. They are a delicacy in Asia, and along the lines have been transported to the eastern part of the United States and have completely taken over the ecosystem of, of you know, lakes in, uh, in the northeast and, and, and southeast part of the United States. The, the python in the Everglades, another thing, it's out, it, it, it's out of balance. Having spent time living in, in Arizona, um, Arizona, most of Arizona is, is, is within the Sonoran Desert, which is the home to the saguaro cactus. The saguaro cactus is the cactus with the, the big arms that you, and this is, you know, again, me being probably a little too literal, but every time I see an old El Paso salsa bottle, with the, with the saguaro cactus on it. There's no snore and desert in Texas. The, the point is the transect applies those principles of nature to the built environment and, and works within the context of transect zones, which as I referred to earlier is, is dealing with the aspects of, of intensity. A T1 zone is natural preserve, a T6 zone is urban core. And then you're going from that, from rural to urban in, in those extremes, and that's what's that's what you're you're regulating in terms of in terms of the transect. So the, the chart here on the right is showing you examples of that in terms of going from T1 to T6 and all of the elements that you would be looking at and, and addressing a little bit different within a form-based code based on its transect context. Everything from, from streets to fences to, to building types, all of those things are, are part of the equation and part of what's being regulated. Now we, we took it a step further and this is where it's, it, it gets really interesting. Um, we, we built into the system that we, we worked on a principle called subsidiarity. Now subsidiarity by definition is, and this is something that uh, the Catholic Church operates under subsidiarity. And they, they've written extensively about this. Um, um, basically what, it's, what it uh, accounts for is the idea that you push decision making to the lowest level of competence. So rather than things going up, you're pushing it down, okay? We took it a step further and added time in terms of when decisions should be made. Because as, as I referenced earlier, use-based zoning front loads the decision-making process and a lot of those decisions at the time that they're made are wrong. Well, what if the system could work things in so that decisions are made when they're supposed to be made? So this, this is a way that I tried, I tried to, to illustrate it in terms, of, in terms of the issue of who, pushing the decisions 
down and then working the aspect of time into it. When are the decisions made? What it also tries to account for is that balance that I referred to earlier between flexibility and certainty. In terms of, just in terms of making life decisions, we make better decisions at the point in time in w at which the decision ought to be made as opposed to making decisions ahead of when they should be made. Now, the, the balance in that is we don't have, we don't have a layer of, of government that's, that's regulating our ability to make decisions. Well, I guess you could argue that. But the, but the point is, you can, you can actually have that, uh, have that worked into the system so that in terms of the steps that are taken, better decisions are made based on when they should be made. In terms of implementing it, we, we wanted to do it based on the human scale using, uh, the, using community types. Um, all of, all of these, these little, you know, you see the, the boxes with the, you know, all of the other squares in them, the, the gray square. I don't, I'm, I'm having a hard time putting words to, to, to the picture. All of those are Mormon settlements that were, that we went back and studied to understand how they did what they did at the time that they did it. We came up with uh, a list of community types based on their, you know, at, at the scale of a human being and the scale of a neighborhood, their rural to urban relationship. And then went through the process of actually coding how you can produce those. Here's an example where we took a portion of Salt Lake City and we broke it down to say what it, what is it. Now the, th the thing that we want to remember in terms of time, Salt Lake City today is not what it was when it was settled, right? I mean same, same thing with Provo. Things change, evolve, and molt. Does the system allow for that to occur? I would argue it doesn't. If, if, if downtown Provo wants to be something different than it is, you have to change the rules. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with downtown Provo. In fact, that's part of what makes Provo, Provo. And is one of the things that, that needs to be, be uh, preserved and built upon. What you're seeing in terms of the different colors of the blocks, the different shades of gray, that is representative of the level of intensity inside of that block. So you can see it's more intense in the middle, it gets less intense as it, as it moves to the edges. We, don't, we looked at different size blocks. The, the Plat of Zion talked about an operating system that, that utilized a 10 acre block, but that that wasn't a standard that was, that was hard and fast because Provo's blocks aren't 10 acres. Springville's blocks aren't two acres, or 10 acres. Um, the, the footprint can change. You just have to think in terms of what the block actually is. It's, it's a subdivision of big to small, and then you're deciding how much stuff are we gonna allow to occur with, within that block. And then, and then th so that you're not creating what I like to, to call planning blight, where you, you overzone the property and then you have to wait for the market to catch up, the property itself can actually evolve over time. I have pictures, and, and I probably should have included them, of Salt Lake City in the late 1800s. Or, excuse me, Main Street in Salt Lake City. Two-story wood buildings. I currently work in an office building on Main Street that's 14 stories tall. 
that was never contemplated at the time it was done, but the, the ability to do it over time until zoning got in, in the way allowed things to, to molt and evolve. Um, Andres Duani talked about the, the, the value of the size of the Mormon block. He, he referred to the 10-acre block as the Mormon block and talked about the advantages of the Mormon block over Portland. Within the world of planning, Portland's blocks are revered. I mean, Port Portland is like utopia in the planning world. And he's basically saying, uh-uh, Salt Lake City, the Mormon block is, that's where it's at. Because a Mormon block can emit a Portland environment within a Mormon block. Portland can't do that. It's too rigid. Here are examples of blocks going from rural to urban. These are footprints that you have in your city right now. I, I, I don't mean these exact footprints, but I mean the operating system and the use of the blocks. You have a lot of that existing in Provo. It's just, it's not, it's, it's not being optimized yet. I'm the third one to use this graphic today. And this is important because what you, what you need to understand and what the others that showed this graphic didn't necessarily address head on, that I will, is you have the bookends of the single family detached and then the mid-rise buildings. That is what zoning favors today. All of those housing types in the middle, by virtue of your zoning laws, are illegal in Provo. And yet they are so critical. Again, it's not, it's not the housing type that's the enemy. It's the context in which it is used and the concentration. Who wants to see, it's, it's, hard for, it's hard for any neighborhood to absorb 300 apartments or 200 townhomes. But if, if, it's, a, if it's a diverse mix, it can be absorbed and actually functions extremely well. Think of it in these terms. This is the way that I've, I've equated it in, in, in my own mind, in terms of what we do within our communities when we're, we're saying we don't want that. Because at a certain level, there's a, there's a social element to this, in saying we don't want those people. The last form of legal segregation in this country is economic. And what we are arguing in terms of, in terms of retail is, hey, we're a target family. We don't want Walmart families in our neighborhood. Or maybe you're a Nordstrom family. The last thing you want is a target family in your neighborhood. Yet that's, that's, part, of, that's part of what the operating system delivers, is the concentration that leads to these arguments. So how do we do it different? We do. Diversi we, the potential exists to do diversity within the block. And what you can end up with is a myriad of different housing types within the same block. That makes for great neighborhoods. It, may, it actually makes for great economics, too. That's a pretty healthy tax base, which is great for the city. That is tremendous bandwidth for a developer. If your bandwidth in terms of providing product is this as opposed to this, that's phenomenal if you're doing it right, but the, the operating system has to allow for it. So this is, this by no means is comprehensive, but this is a list of advantages that that you know, I've, I, I've identified over time that a form-based code provides. I am putting forth to you today that if you are, 
if you are looking at changing how you do things in Provo, this is a great solution. Again, it's not the end all be all. It has its warts, just like, just like the, the system that you have in place right now. But its weaknesses are far fewer and the results will be far better. And then really quickly, I'm, uh, I had a number of, of, uh, of developer quotes. These are developers that have actually worked with form-based codes. And they're, you know, they're, they're saying different things, yet they're saying the same thing. Some of them are actually very direct in saying, look, as far as a developer, I'm not, I'm not even going to operate unless I'm, unless I'm within a municipality that has a form-based code. That's how seriously I want it. You heard it today from this platform. Dave Gardner told you, give me a form-based code. I'll take it all day long. Um, I, I hope this has been helpful. Again, I'm very appreciative of, of, of having had this opportunity. I hope the no-hitter stayed intact. I'm not, the, I'm not the judge of that. All of you are. Um, but I, I feel like in terms of what you've gotten today, pull me out of it. I've, I've, been, I've been educated. I've, I've learned some things. And you, you, you all have been well fed in terms of an education today. And my hope is that I contributed to that. Thank you. Michael, I, I haven't asked a question all day, so I'm going to take the last chance. Okay. Um, one of the co current discussions that percolates quite often up in this community, and I don't think it's unique to Provo, probably a lot of Utah, is, and if we could go back a few slides, um, this idea of aging in place or, well, I've out, I've out, my house has outgrown my family. You know, the kids have moved on. Um, but the community, the Mormon context behind that community prevents me want from wanting to downsize, leave, because there's no other options in the neighborhood. Can you speak more to that just for one minute? Oh, I'd, I'd love to. <clears throat> from a, if I understand the question, if I understand your question correctly, Matt, it's more about the aspects of, of the ward. Is that, am I... Or am I miss? I think that's a major component. Yes. Okay. The thing that I want you to under, understand, I've, I've, I've had the good fortune of spending the past three years working with the church's meeting house and facilities department, looking at the issue of word creation. Because what I want all of you to understand, and this will resonate with you. In fact, you can you can pull the church out of it, and just think of it in terms of neighborhood. But from, from the standpoint of an LDS ward, what works best is a diversity of housing. When there is a lack of diversity over time, and we're finding that within the course of a generation being 30 to 35 years, the ward will die. Because it does not have the ability to rejuvenate itself. That's not the church's fault. The church has to react to growth, just like the schools. When, when, you, when you have turnover in a neighborhood and, and schools have the same problems, schools will die. You'll have to, you, you've experienced that here in Provo, where you've had to convert schools to other uses because the need for the civic use has gone away. It isn't able to re, rejuvenate itself. So it's been, we, we've been trying to understand, understand those relationships. Um, one of the, I mean, the, the, um, the responsible party, as far as I'm concerned, is the zoning. The zoning forces homogenous communities. It forces you to concentrate housing types in blocks that then emit wards that lack 
the capacity to sustain themselves. I don't, did that, did that cover en enough? Absolutely, I, okay. I think it's a relevant topic and I've heard it come up several times, so. The, 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 the exciting thing to consider is that it can be addressed. That is a, that is a core element of the city of Provo. There isn't a higher concentration of Mormons anywhere in the world than Utah County. So it's, it's, part of, it's part of what makes Utah County what it is, and it's one of those concerns. And there are opportunities to, to fix that, but you have to, you have to know how to, how to deal with the issue. Okay, thanks. <laughs>